The chain of command and obeying orders are two concepts considered essential to military competence, let alone success. Even so, military history is still full of people who disobeyed orders for all sorts of reasons, and it wound up being the best decision they ever made. So, today, we're going to take a look at some people who changed history by disregarding orders. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other military topics you would like to hear about. Okay, one order of Weird History coming up. During the 13 days of October 1962, known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States and the Soviet Union barely avoided a nuclear war that would have devastated the planet. Negotiations between President John F. Kennedy and Premier Nikita Khrushchev were ultimately successful, no thanks to a jumpy Soviet submarine captain. That sub was stationed in the Caribbean, equipped with a nuclear missile that had nearly the same destructive power as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The sub also had orders to attack American forces if provoked, without needing approval from Moscow. When the American Navy began dropping depth charges nearby, Valentin Savitsky, the sub's commander, thought that war had begun and ordered the missile to launch. Luckily, the fleet's commander, Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov, was also on board and thought that the Americans were only trying to get the submarine to surface. Even though he couldn't be sure, he talked Savitsky into disregarding the order to attack and averted nuclear war. Luckily, nothing like that ever happened again, until 1983. You'd think that nearly kick-starting nuclear Armageddon once would be enough for anyone. But the Soviet army wasn't just anyone. And more than two decades after submarine officer Vasily Arkhipov avoided nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it happened again. On September 26, 1983, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov was stationed at the Serpukov-15 bunker near Moscow, part of the Soviet Air Defense Forces, when the early warning system detected what appeared to be an incoming American intercontinental ballistic missile. Soviet military protocol said to, at the very least, notify superiors, if not counterattack. Most people probably would have wet themselves and hid in a closet. But Petrov and his staff decided alone that it was a false alarm. And they were right. Turns out the system was triggered by the sun reflecting off the clouds. Uh, whoops. By refusing to launch an attack, Petrov potentially averted billions of deaths, and what very well could have been the end of human civilization. So, like, good call, Lieutenant Colonel. On April 22, 1951, during the Korean War, the Chinese Army launched the Spring Offensive against American forces, sending 300,000 troops. Two days later, as American forces were being overwhelmed, a unit from the 8th Ranger Company was caught behind the advance, kind of like MASH meets Black Hawk Down. The unit's commander, E.C. Rivera, radioed for help, but the remaining American forces had already decided to retreat. Rivera and his 65 men would have been doomed, if not for Lieutenant David Tyke. Disobeying his captain, Tyke sent four tanks to Rivera's position on Hill 26-8 and retrieved the stranded Rangers. We sure hope those guys bought him a beer or something. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Desmond Doss was given the option for a draft deferment due to his work at a shipyard. But like roughly 72,000 others, he chose to serve with one big asterisk. Because he refused to take a life on religious grounds, he became a combat medic for the 77th Infantry and refused to carry a gun. While this was technically within the military rules, his refusal and his exemption from training on Saturdays made him unpopular with his fellow soldiers. That is, until Doss was sent to combat and saved the lives of about 75 wounded soldiers under heavy gunfire at the Battle of Okinawa. And after that, everyone respected that guy. He was awarded a Medal of Honor for his actions at Okinawa, becoming the first and only conscientious objector in World War II to receive the honor, additionally earning two bronze stars during his time in the military. He also later received the highest honor of all, being played by Andrew Garfield in a film. Thank you for your service, Spider-Man. During World War II, Lieutenant Thomas Diver Derrick was one of the most decorated and beloved soldiers in the Australian Army's most decorated and beloved battalions. For example, Derrick was involved in the Battle of Saddleburg in New Guinea in November 1943. After a week of fighting, the battalion's progress stalled and Derrick's commanding officer ordered a retreat. Derek, evidently going for his unit's high score, 
said, bugger the CO, just give me 20 minutes and we'll have this place. He then personally advanced on multiple Japanese machine gun positions. Uphill through the jungle, under cover fire from his squad mates, he managed to clear out 10 enemy positions, helping his unit accomplish their objective and receiving the Victoria Cross for his efforts. Unfortunately, Derek perished late in the war. But crikey, did that guy leave an impression. When the Allied forces successfully invaded northern France on D-Day on June 6, 1944, and then pushed to take Paris in August, Adolf Hitler, who on top of everything else was a sore loser, ordered local forces to burn down most of the city to keep it from falling into enemy hands. Luckily, the commander of the 1st German Army, General Dietrich von Koltitz, refused to comply. Um, maybe. In his 1951 memoirs, Koltitz claimed that he felt the orders had no military value and that Hitler was mentally unwell. However, some French observers have argued that Koltitz merely lacked the troops to carry out the orders and that he later lied to salvage his reputation. Whatever the reason, the order went unfulfilled and Paris stood. In March of 1945, the Allies captured the final bridge on the Rhine River that allowed access into Germany. At that point, Hitler issued an extreme command, the Demolitions on Reich Territory Order, popularly known as the Nero Decree. And any decree with Nero's name attached to it isn't going to be too good for anyone. This order would have wiped out all of Germany's industry and infrastructure to keep it from falling under Allied control. Hitler was apparently unconcerned about the impact the order would have on his country's vulnerable civilian population. But that's not surprising because, well, he's Hitler. The task fell to Germany's armaments minister and Hitler's personal friend, Albert Speer. But Speer wasn't into it. Like General Koltitz, who had declined to burn Paris for a similar reason, Speer suspected the Fuhrer was losing it. More than he already had, that is. Speer publicly issued the order but he also quietly issued encrypted alternate orders to delay their implementation. And that delay was enough to save Germany. On March 7, 1915, the French 336th Infantry Regiment was ordered to attack entrenched German machine gun positions. The attacks went on for two days, and when the divisional commander, General Giraud Ravaillac, ordered another charge, the 21st Company refused. A furious Ravaillac ordered his artillery commander, Colonel Raoul Berhoubet, to fire on his own troops. But Berhoubet, apparently not hot on being remembered as one of his country's greatest monsters, also refused. Despite the fact that Berhoubet was clearly the hero of the story, Ravaillac was the one who received the Grand Officer of the Legion of Honor and retired with honors, taking all the credit like a high school lab partner. At the end of the reign of Emperor Augustus, who ruled from 27 BCE to 14 CE, the Roman military had devoted much of its power to suppressing a revolt in Illyricum. This led to the notorious destruction of three legions at Teutoburg Forest in Germany. And to replenish its losses, the Roman military started re-enlisting veterans and drafting freed slaves. In other words, the legion grew full of people who really didn't want to be there and who felt their rights were being ignored. But as dissatisfied as the soldiers were, they were at least loyal to Augustus. So it wasn't like they were going to mutiny, unless Augustus died, which he did. The nerve of that guy. The soldiers revolted and whacked their company commanders, which is how people went on strike back in the day. The job of stopping the Rhine mutiny fell to Germanicus, a popular former commander and the nephew of the new emperor Tiberius. Germanicus temporarily placated the mutinous soldiers by agreeing to release everyone who had participated in 20 or more campaigns immediately, and then paying off their salaries. But when Tiberius sent a Senate delegation to investigate the mutiny, the legions revolted again. This time, the soldiers threatened Germanicus's pregnant wife, Agrippina, who is Augustus's granddaughter, and their toddler son, Gaius, better known to history by his childhood nickname, Caligula. Germanicus shamed them for threatening the lives of Augustus's descendants after they'd been so loyal to him. The mutineers' resolve broke, and their ringleaders were executed. Then, Germanicus led the formerly rebellious soldiers on a successful expedition across the Rhine, which proved their loyalty again. All's well that ends well, except for all those people who got killed. 
1857, the British East India Company had controlled India with a repressive regime for about a century. So you can imagine how the Indians felt about them. Indian leaders began to talk of revolt, and the Indian Mutiny began in the spring of that year. But the mutiny started with a group of 90 sepoys, or Indian infantrymen, who refused to follow a specific order. At the time, British Enfield rifles used cartridges that were reportedly greased with a mixture of cow and pig fat. To load their rifles, soldiers were required to tear the paper wrapping off the cartridges with their teeth. The sepoys, being a mixture of Hindu and Muslim troops, objected to putting the rumored cow and pig grease in their mouths for religious reasons, and refused to use the cartridges. On May 8th, the troops were found guilty of insubordination in a court-martial, and the Indian mutiny began two days later. However, the British ultimately defeated the Indian mutiny and took direct control of India, establishing the British Raj that would last until 1947. General Daniel Sickles was a Tammany Hall politician with ambitions of becoming president, but that dream died when a bit of political scandal erupted after he whacked his wife's lover. Good luck winning Iowa with that strategy, Sickles. When the American Civil War broke out in 1861, Sickles, hoping to improve his murderous reputation, raised a brigade and made himself its commander. On July 2nd, during the Battle of Gettysburg, Sickles' brigade was ordered to defend a portion of Cemetery Ridge that included Little Round Top. Fearing that the lay of the land made this position indefensible, Sickles asked the general for permission to advance three quarters of a mile to Emmitsburg Road instead. The general refused, but Sickles did it anyway, which left his unit vulnerable to flanking attacks and also left Little Round Top undefended. This probably did not improve his reputation as he'd hoped, but we're sure the presidency's coming in no time. In the ensuing Confederate attack, Sickles was forced to retreat and lost almost 40% of his force. Thanks to the heroics of other Union soldiers, the Confederate advance was repelled. But those heroics would not have been necessary if not for Sickles' catastrophic decision. Sickles maintained, to the end of his days, that his insubordination helped the Army of the Potomac survive the day's assaults, which, in his defense, was technically true. But it didn't get him any closer to the White House. So what do you think? Would you ever disobey an order? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.